Hey everyone, welcome to this special video today. We have Mark Erickson here and he's going to talk about Redux Toolkit Query. We released Redux Toolkit 1.6 about a month-ish ago and it has a brand new API that we call RTK Query. Over the last two years, what I've seen is that the React ecosystem has migrated from thinking about state management as the problem to solve to thinking about data fetching and caching. And that's why you see libraries like Apollo and React Query and Urkel and SWR becoming so popular. People don't want to write thunks and acts and reducers just to fetch a list of items from the server. They don't want to manage loading state. They just want to say, here's my URL, go get the data for me and tell me when it's here so I can render. One of the reasons why those libraries have become so popular is that they all abstract the data fetching process, making the request, managing the loading state, caching the data, and updating when the loading state or the data changes. I'd always figured we'd eventually add something data fetching related to Redux Toolkit, but I figured it would be like a create API data fetching slice thing that generates some funks for REST operations. In December, Lens Weber and Matt Sikowski randomly started building a new brilliant library by itself to solve that use case, but on top of Redux Toolkit. They did the initial development as a standalone library for speed of iteration, but the idea was always to move it back into the Redux Toolkit package itself. It's in Redux Toolkit, and the idea is that by defining a set of data fetching endpoints ahead of time, we can automatically generate all the slice logic, the reducers, the loading state, the thunks, middleware, everything for you. And all that logic is built on top of Redux Toolkit. So it's actually UI agnostic. You can use it with any UI layer or no UI at all, but we actually have a React specific layer on top of that that can automatically generate hooks. The typical example that we have down here is like a little Pokemon example. So there's like a public Pokemon API where you can, you know, names of Pokemon. You call this create API function and you define the base URL of the server that we're going to fetch data from. And then you define one or more endpoints in here. Oh, neat. It is all contained in one spot. So you'll know yep. all the endpoints you're trying to hit. We've got a similar looking kind of a builder style API. It's different from create slice, but it's similar syntactically. And the builder allows you to generate either query endpoint for fetching data, mutation endpoints for updating data. In this case, we're defining an endpoint called get Pokemon by name it is a query endpoint. This is a TypeScript. So the return type from the server is a Pokemon object and the parameter for our query function is a string. The return value here is going to end up getting added to the base URL. We're going to end up hitting Pokemon API or Poke API slash API slash V2 slash Pokemon slash name of Pokemon. And it automatically generates a React hook based on the name of the endpoint. Use get Pokemon by name query. And it's all correctly TypeScript typed as far as the inputs and the outputs. I want to go back to this real quick and describe how neat this is. We're creating the API and we can get a hook off that API. This is the coolest part about it is that you're passing in this base domain and the V2 is in there. You could create a separate API for every version of your API. And then now you get the custom hook just for that version of the API. This solves a lot of problems I've had in the past with how do you manage different versions in different fetch calls and different components. And it's really cool that you're creating custom hooks that utilize a base URL yep. to a version or even change the addresses of each API. Yeah, our, our standard recommendation is that most apps will probably only have a single API slice for the whole app because most apps are only talking to one server. If your blog post server has separate endpoints for slash posts, slash comments, slash users, you would define one API slice that just has multiple different endpoints attached to it. Now, if you really are talking to several different servers completely, you might define multiple different API slices. There are actually some ways to talk to multiple different servers from within a single API slice. So you can define a customized query function instead of providing like a piece of a URL here. If you want to have an arbitrary async function that goes off somewhere, 
and return something, you can use that instead and it will still generate all the hooks and everything else. I'm wondering if people should have multiple versions of the API out in production at the same time. And so if you did have multiple versions of it out, would you recommend putting the V2 as part of the query path when you're trying to, oh, actually you're just calling dot query as a function that you would have to have separate APIs. I, I could see doing it both ways. Like if, like in this case, like if the V1 and V2 are both part of the same base URL, mm -hmm. you could just sort of kind of duplicate your list of endpoints here. That's what I was thinking is that when you make a V2, you would just copy paste it and then modify it as necessary for the new API. Pretty much. Whatever is different. Yep. And so you, you do a little bit of store setup. You include the auto generated re reducer as a top level slice. You include the auto generated middleware as one of the middleware. We have some optional capabilities for doing automated refetching based on focus of the page that you can set up. But in terms of actual usage, that's basically it. This looks right like there. other query libraries, except for thankfully you put is yes. loading and not just loading. There there's actually a whole bunch of different Boolean options on here, but they're all derived from internal status flags. So like we, we keep a status num internally, but it's actually possible to, for more than one of these to be true at the same time. Maybe we already have data from a previous fetch, but we are in the process of fetching new data based on a change in the argument. Maybe is loading or is success and is that sheen are true at the same time. This is interesting because I wrote something similar years ago where we were fetching from cache. Then I was also in the background fetching the data at the same time if it came back from cache. Either way, I was always fetching the data. But then you would have to manage this. I had like five different states that they could possibly be in with two different things or maybe more, but it could have been from cache or you're loading from the data fetch or you already have the data and things like that. If you, if you look at just this one example right here, you could conceivably use the, the status flags to show a loading spinner. Or you could skip showing a loading spinner at all and just show the new data once it's ready and, and keep the old data on screen until then. Like those are both viable patterns for updating the UI. When you're saying there are other Booleans here and uh, this is loading, are there other ones that are a little bit more granular that can give you that? Yeah, there, there's like five different flags in here and I don't remember what all they are. I would have to either look at the docs or pull up one of the sandboxes. I, I will also point out we have extensive documentation oh, over here. This is much better than anything else I've seen from Redux. This is like a lot of documentation here. Huge props to Lens Weber and Matt Sikowski for doing most of the development work. Matt wrote most of the first docs pages while this was still in alpha and a lot of the examples. Then we had an Australian programmer who goes by the handle of Shrugzy, who just showed up in chat one day and started cranking out docs PRs as we were closing in on getting this released. Half the docs content here was written by Shrugzy a one month period. Wow, that's incredible. Also, I did notice there's is fetching. I see that up there, there yep. too. Yeah, so there's a lot of cool stuff that you guys have created with this. And what I like is that the API looks nice. Here's a list of some of the options that come back in the object returned by the hooks. Error is uninitialized. Is loading is basically, is it going for the first time? Is fetching is, is it not getting data at all? is success is does it have actual data at all or is it error and there's a function to force a refresh if desired um, oh. but most of the time most of the time you would by passing in a different parameter to the hook. How does that work? I'm not quite sure how I'm following because I don't have enough information of how the query is. Let's see, do we, okay, we we have a Pokemon example down here. Let's open up that sandbox. This is the deduping queries example. Okay, here we, we've we got our use get Pokemon by name query and we're passing in the current name of the Pokemon, which is getting as a prop. So in fact, you notice, well, let's actually talk about that for a second. So you notice we've got two Bulbasaurs and a Pikachu up here. If we were to open this up and look at the network tab, you would have seen only two network requests go out because the first component loads and it's and it basically creates an internal subscription to Pokemon as the query to Bulbasaur as the query key. So we start that request. And the second component's effect runs and it says, I would also like data for Bulbasaur. Oh, wait, we've got that in progress. We don't need to make a second request in flight. There's a promise that's made when you do a fetch call. So what's happening is you are probably storing that promise somewhere. And then when the second one happens, that you're grabbing onto that promise and dot venting it so that when the data comes back, both of them get it. What's that? It's not even the promise. We track the metadata for all the requests in the Redux store itself. Oh. And you can see the key under the queries section is the name of the query plus a serialized version 
of the argument to that query. So like here, it's a simple string. It could be like an object with an array inside. It, and we'll just serialize that to a string and use that as the cache key for that request. This is exactly how I did this when I was doing something similar years ago. But what about maps and sets? That's our standard Redux thing where you really shouldn't put non-serializable values in the Redux store. And actually Redux Toolkit will slap your hand if you do that and say, please don't. Okay, it tells you at least that you're doing something. More. Yeah, okay. the toolkit itself, the store adds two different middleware in development mode. One will catch accidental mutations and, and throw an error, and the other will warn about not serializable values. Here you can see that when the second component mounts, we've already got our query in progress, or in this case, fulfilled for the Bulbor request. And we now have a second query in progress for the Pikachu request. That one resolves and it's now fulfilled. And, and there's the data for that one. If multiple components mount and they all use the same query with the same argument, the request only gets made once. It's deduplicated. And if you pass in a different query argument, it forces a new fetch. We don't have that in cache. If I change the Bulbasaur, if the Bulbasaur component had a button to change it to be, I don't know, Charizard or something, we pass in a different argument to that hook. The hook, I don't have Charizard cached. Let me go fetch it. This is a really nice debuggable API. Yep. So, so here's the thing. You can see all this data literally in the Redux store right now. I'm just looking at it with the standard Redux dev tools as is. But the, the Redux DevTools extension already has three different monitor panels. And most of the time we're used to looking at what's known as the inspector panel, but it also has a chart or a log, which shows you diffs and a chart, which shows you like the data structure in here. A contributor has been working on a new monitor specifically for RTK query. Let me see if I can find that PR. It, it, it's not burned in yet. They're working on it and they have a demo example. Here it's being shown in app, but imagine this being in the DevTools extension itself in the near future. Here you can see the names of the queries. You can see some of the details. You can filter them and you can filter the queries by different parameters. You can sort the queries by different parameters. And it's all just looking at the exact same data in the Redux store and presenting it in a different visualization. On the left side, instead of seeing actions, we're seeing the queries. What is different on the right side? This is the contents of the query. We can see what the key is, where in the state this is being kept, what some of the data is that came back, the status flags, how long it took. Here we could see the actions that got dispatched as part of that query. RTK query has a whole bunch of options for saying this query provides certain types of data so that you can do invalidation and automated refetching if you make like a post request to change it on the server later. So okay. here I can see that this query provides two different tags. It provides a generic Pokemon tag. If I said I want to refetch all Pokemon, this query would be forced to refetch. And it also provides a specific Pokemon Parasect. I could invalidate just this one entry and refetch it. And I can also see that there is one component that is subscribed to this data, whereas there's two oh. Tangelas on screen right now. So there's two active subscriptions to that. I do like being able to see the subscription. I would actually wish that the current Redux would also show which to subscribe. You know, that would be that would be really cool too. It's nice that this includes it. Yeah, but this is just another contributor from the community who's been working on this. He cranked it out two to three weeks. This demo is out there. I don't have a timeline for for when it'll go added to the dev tools because I don't maintain them, but this looks pretty to me. Yeah, it does look very nice. In theory, an upcoming release of the dev tools extension for Firefox and Chrome could very well have this built in and it would be another thing you could select from the dropdown up here. That'll be fantastic. I'm really excited about this. I don't expect every Redux app to just suddenly switch and use RTK query, but we've seen a lot of people being very, very enthusiastic about it, both before and after release. We've seen a very rapid rise in questions about using it in React Flux, some on Stack Overflow. Realistically speaking, if your app involves requesting data from a server, you could use RTK query and not ever write a single thunk or reducer related to data fetching in your entire app. There may be times you might still want to, but it is very realistic to build an app around RTK query for all the data fetching logic that do 
normal actions and reducers from any of the more business logic on the client side. Yeah, that's a pretty incredible change. I kind of wish, that, well, I don't kind of wish, I, I do wish that this was you no know, like there a couple years ago. I think it would have made a bigger impact. Yeah. Still really nice. It's got a nice API. There's a really good debugging tools. I think that's like the major benefit for all of this is the debugging. Because yeah. it goes to Redux, then you have a centralized location. You can debug it and that makes it easy to figure out what's happening, what's wrong with your app, how, how state is moving, what order things are right? exactly exactly we've deliberately avoided the whole like redux versus context or is redux dead discussion but I'll, I'll actually touch on that very tangentially here a lot of that stems from people only seeing redux for a couple of specific use cases things like avoiding props and whatnot and or even fetching and caching like up until now there was no purpose-built data fetching solution for redux you could write it yourself but it involved a lot of code and so that's why like well yeah context avoids prop really therefore you don't need redux or React Query does all the data fetching, therefore I don't need Redux. And it's people looking at Redux only for those one or two specific use cases. Redux by itself is a very generic kind of low level tool that you can use in a lot of ways. And so all these other tools are kind of overlap with those potential use cases. So I've been trying to emphasize more strongly over the last couple of years that the main reasons to use Redux are the centralization, the ability to debug the state changes like this, the ability to write more of your code as pure functions. So like you're, you're never gonna eliminate side effects. Side effects are part of actual applications. But if you can write more code as pure functions, that's less of your code that you're worried about in the end. And that those are really the best reasons you want to use Redux. I mean, yeah, you can you can avoid prop drilling, you can use it for data fetching, but the best reasons are centralization, debuggability, pure functions. Yeah, I agree that debugging is my main reason. I also use it with Redux Observable to get because I have a little bit I use it more for the event driven nature of it, but also the debugging is so easy. You can just see yep. the state, you can get into it, you can see what events occurred in what order. It's very, very useful. And I agree with you there is that the debugging is key. That's one of the things that you, you wouldn't get with context. In fact, one of the problems with React Context is that it's magic state, it's magic stuff happening all over, and yep. it can force components to re-render in, in ways that you maybe didn't expect. <laughs> now you've got to you've got to figure out like, oh, why did this break? There's a magic context behind the scenes. And with Redux, it's pretty clear where that state would be coming from. Yep. The React team is actually working on a context selectors API. That concludes the end of this video. We were talking about Redux Toolkit Query. And then next time, we're going to talk about Redux selectors. Thanks for watching.